if I'm asked a question, it's yeah, Clark, sure. Federated Farmers. Yeah. Hi, Hi. Um, and thanks for the presentation. Very, very helpful and, and useful. Just on the, just interested in the in your thoughts on the Productivity Commission inquiry. And I noticed in terms of reference, there are three things that are out of scope. Uh, one of them is particular mechanisms for rating Maori freehold land and crown land. The second one is the valuation systems and practices, and the third is something which is a bit vague and is to know what you think of this or what it means, substantial privatisation, those three, three things out of scope. Um, why, why are those three things out of scope in particular? And does, in, in your view, does that potentially um, constrain the Commission in any way of looking at things that might actually make a difference to the way council, um, council local government is funded? Uh, well, I think the first thing I'd say is that the, those exclusions were put in place by the government, not by us, so I, I really yeah, can't I understand. Uh, answer exactly. But I think it would be fair to say that we think there's, pl even with those excluded, there's plenty for, uh, for the Productivity c uh, Commission to chew on um, uh, besides those. Um, the last one you mentioned was... Um, uh, Oh, not privatisation. I think that just refers to the fact that the government has said there are things like, um, you know, in, in the context of um, uh, Minister Mahuda's talking about what reforms there may be in the water sector, she has made it very clear um, privatisation is not uh, is not a, a, even a starter. So I think that's what that is um, referring to. It's just reinforcing the fact that that's not the road the government's prepared to go down. I'd be interested in that. Would that uh, I mean, I'm interested to know whether... Um, sorry, so asking a supplementary question: Whether that substantial privatisation means that you know we're obviously not talking about water and roads and you know the big infrastructure that councils deal with, but whether things like golf courses, the car park buildings, um, would cover would come into that particular exclusion? Well, uh, I, I suspect that in any in the, any local government context with a reasonable size council, they wouldn't be seen as substantial. But I, do I just to clarify? Do I? understand that you mean whether uh, councils would be at liberty to sell those off in order to you know, balance their books or whatever. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, those sorts of things shouldn't be precluded. <laughs> uh, I, 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 my impression, and I, again, I can't say for sure, but my impression would be that they wouldn't be because, as I say, in any context, they're hardly likely to be substantial um, right. in, in any case. But, and they're, also, and they're also probably not consistent across the sector as well. Not every council has got a large amount of surplus assets as well. So, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Cheers. Um, just with the Three Waters Review, could you just give a little bit more detail in terms of um, how you see um, this process playing out from here? And also I'm aware of at least one council um, is going to come out this week and say they were going to oppose any move to, to, to take away their power over water, or to centralise it, or take away local control sort of thing. Um, I mean, presumably, if you go down that model of centralising it, you're going to face opposition. What's, what's your response? Well, the Local Government New Zealand's position is that we believe that what the government should be doing in, in response to the recommendations from the Havelock North inquiry around drinking water, and it's important to note that that is what it was about. It was about drinking water. It wasn't about wastewater or stormwater, yeah. albeit that we know that there are issues there. Our view is that it would be um, appropriate for the government to set in place uh, a regulator and standards and uh, expect, in fact, require the sector to meet those. And how we meet them as owners of the assets would be up to us in the first instance. But it would be clear that since there was a requirement, there was no, there's no, oh, best efforts will suffice, it's kind of out clause, uh, if it would be clear that if uh, a council didn't meet them, then the government would would, be, would expect to be able to step in and do something else about it. But our first position is, uh, historically, we have um, provided, uh, councils have provided water services uh, very well for decades. Uh, if there's a need to lift the standards and uh, it clearly is, given the Havelock North Inquiry, then put the standards in place, put the regulators and regulations in place and say, meet them and give us a time frame and let us respond. Okay. And presumably the government is going to lift the, the standard of water that has to be supplied. 
that's going to be quite an expensive process for some councils and authorities, isn't it? Well, it's not clear. It's not clear that they will lift a standard. They may just expect that the the standard will be enforced and will be uh, complied with. The, the standard, um, if, uh, if, for instance, the standard is demonstrably safe, with, that's what it's been all along. It's just that um, the incentives haven't been there for councils to uh, meet it because, of, because there was an out clause. Uh, and um, it'd be fair to say that um, uh, enforcement by um, central government agencies has been was laxed, uh, or, or, well, spotty, put it that way. In some parts of the country, it was working pretty well. In other parts, clearly, it, it, it wasn't. I had a few different views. Sure. Um, so first on the local tourism levy, um, I wondered if you have a figure on, I know that you've made a submission, is there, is there a number um, that you, you'd like local mm -hmm. businesses to charge? This is this is with regard to a bit kind of bed tax. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not sure that we no, do. No, we, we haven't worked through that uh, detail. What we'd like to get done first is, is, is agreement to the principal and then work through with the government on um, some options. So what our next step would be is some case studies around what a suitable level of a bed tax would be. But of course that may vary if you're, if you're in Queenstown or Auckland relative to Wellington, for example. Yeah. Um, so, so that would be the next stage for development. Yeah, I think that it was noted that there's at least two options. One, you could say it's, it's $10 a bed night, mm -hmm. or you could say it's a proportion of the tariff. And in which case, uh, if if a, if a hotel was charging $500 a night and the proportion was, was 5%, then it would be $25. But if a, a, an Airbnb charging 100 it would be it would yeah. be fine. I think Queenstown have started to do a little bit of work around what that, that levy could be, um, but that would be very much the next stage of development. And um, we're quite open to having some, um, some, I guess, some structure around that. In other words, we wouldn't want it as an unlimited pool. Uh, there would be some probably ceiling limits around that too. That's an important part of the confidence around it. Mm -hmm. So the, the stage that you're at with that is that you've made a submission on the government levy. Have you had any engagement with, directly with the, I don't know, the Minister of Government or anything like that? Do you have any signals from government about what they're uh, we, the, the, the conversations have been in the context of the border levy for a start. Uh, we, we asked for, uh, we, we, we expressed our preference for a local tax. Um, the government was already doing work on a border levy, which we support, but what we're saying uh, and now engaging with the government on is the need for additional funding lines through uh, a local levy. Some of that may well be picked up in the Productivity Commission funding inquiry as well. But we've just um, popped this our submission went in just a few weeks ago, so it be in the process of working that through. The Minister has said, though, he feels a package of funding options is important, and I think they state that in their, in their submission document. They refer to the need for a package of funding options. Um, and then on the, um, the LGFA, um, so the alternative debt vehicles for Auckland Council have been discussed before at these meetings that I've been to, um, and with the increased the, the debt track that, that a lot of these other councils are on, are you considering those for other councils as well? Is that something that they might need? So, yes, so to date we only lend to councils um, secured against rates, so the housing infrastructure fund, the SPVs that are being talked about are alternative funding outside of the LGFA model. Um, and so um, we're happy for those to occur because obviously there's a need for further infrastructure and, and the problem is uh, the revenue streams associated with that. So if they can go off balance sheet and other entities can lend on that and also uh, attract revenue streams to fund it, then that is actually great. Um, so the probably the issue with them is around scalability. Um, so the benefit of our GFA has been we've scaled up very quickly, we can deliver savings. So on these SPVs, the uh, public-private partnerships, they're all 
relatively small scales and needs to be an aggregation somehow rather get the benefits from it. Um, but, but we think it's good. We also think it's good from the fact that with these sorts of vehicles, um, it's a further step towards user charging as well too, um, which is what we need as well, so that if a new uh, housing area is going in, then those who are buying those houses are actually paying fully for the services going to those houses as well too. So, so we welcome it. Um, the, the, as I said, it's a scale issue and whether or not it can be rolled out to the rest of the country or if that scale will preclude you know, a number of councils from participating in those schemes. Yes. Just uh, another question on Wellington Water. Um, it sees its, itself as a really successful example of providing water, um, drinking water in particular, um, and I think they suspect that the Minister might be looking at them in terms of a nationwide sort of model to work elsewhere. I mean, what's your view of Wellington Water and is it a potential nationwide model? Um, well, what, what Wellington Water is, an, is an example of the fact that different uh, solutions will be a, appropriate in different parts of the country. So, uh, from all accounts, Wellington Water is a very successful model for Wellington. Yeah. Uh, and I know that certain other, some other areas of the country, uh, groups of councils are looking at what they might do. But our position is that it should be up to the councils or groups of councils to respond in the in, to the requirements of, say, regulation or standards in the way that best suits their community and their circumstances. And just to reinforce, you said before that that wouldn't be privatisation. That's your... Um, the, 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 the Minister has said privatisation is off the table. Yeah. 